Section six of Brazilian Tales. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lini. Brazilian Tales by various authors. Translated by Isaac Goldberg. Section six. Ends as as tears by Carmen Dolores. Pale and thin, for eighteen years she had lived with her youngest sister, who had married very early, and now possessed five children two young ladies of marriageable age, a third still in short dresses, and two little boys. Maria José, whose nickname was Zezé, had never been beautiful or winning. Upon her father's death, it was thought best that she should go to live with her sister and Gracina's family. Here she led a monotonous existence, helping to bring up her nephews and nieces, who were born in that young and happy household with a regularity that brooked small intervals between the births. A long, pointed nose disfigured her face, and her lips, extremely thin, looked like a pale crack. Her thoughtful gaze alone possessed a certain melancholy attractiveness. But even here, her eyes, protruding too far for the harmony of the lines upon her face, seemed always to be red, and her brows narrow and sparse. Of late, an intricate network of wrinkles as fine as hairs had formed at the corner of her eyes. From her nose, likewise, two furrows ran along the transparent delicacy of her skin and reached either side of her mouth. When she smiled, these wrinkles would cover her countenance with a mask of premature age and threaten soon to disfigure her entirely. And yet, from habit, and through passive obedience to routine, Maria José continued to dress like a young girl of eighteen, in brightly colored gowns, thin waists, and white hats that ill became her frail and oldish face. She would remain for a long time in painful indecision when it was a matter of picking out some pieces of goods that was of too bright a red or blue, as if instinctively she understood the disharmony of these hues with her age, whose rapid oncoming they, moreover, placed in all the more noticeable contrast. And at such times, and Gracina and her daughters would say to her, with a vehemence whose effect they little guessed, Why, Zezé, buy something and be done with it. How silly! Do you want to dress like a widow? What a notion! And at bottom they meant it. None of them saw Maria José as she really was. Living with her day by day had served to efface the actual appearance of the faded old maid, for, in the minds of the mother and her daughters, who were moreover of frivolous and indifferent sort, Zazé had grown to be the type, very vague to be sure, but the eternal type of young girl of marriageable years who always should be well dressed and smiling. When she would be out, walking with her nieces of sixteen and seventeen years, who wore the same clothes as she herself did, but whose graceful and lively charm became their gay colors of youth so well, Zazé's intelligence saw only too plainly the contrast between her and them. She would hold aloof from the laughing set, morose, wounded, as if oppressed by an unspeakable shame. Ha! Who can depict the secret chagrin of an old maid who sees pass by in useless monotony her dark, loveless, despairing days, without hope even of some event of personal interest? while about her moves the busy whirl of happier creatures, whose life has but one goal, who feel emotions and tendernesses, and who look upon her simply as an obscure accessory in the household affairs. They all loved her, of course, but not one of them suspected that she, too, could cherish those aspirations that are common to all human beings. Her self-denial seemed to be a most natural thing. Indeed, they hardly considered her in the light of a living person. She was no longer of any consequence. This was an attitude that satisfied the general egotism of the family, and to which they all had grown accustomed, never suspecting the grievous aspect of her sacrifice, which was hidden by a sentiment of proud dignity. So, when they would go to the theatre, and the box held only five, and Gracina, her husband Fabio, and the three young ladies, Maria José knew, beforehand, that her sister, snugly wrapped in her opera cloak, would come to her and say gently, in that purring voice of hers, "'You'll stay at home with the children to-night, won't you, Zezé? Little Paul isn't very well, 
and I wouldn't think of leaving him with anybody else. And she would remain behind, without betraying the revolt within her, which, upon each occasion of these evidences of selfishness, would make the anemic blood in her veins tremble with agitation. Alone in the dining-room she would ply her needle mechanically, while her nephews would amuse themselves with the toys scattered upon the table, colored pictures and lead soldiers. Every other moment they would call her, "'Aunt Zazé, look at George pinching me! I am not! Paul hit me first. And the good aunt would quiet them. Then, after both had been put to sleep in their little twin beds, she would rest her elbows upon the window-sill of her gloomy old maid's room, and placing both hands beneath her sharp chin, her gaze directed towards heaven, she would lose herself in contemplation of the stars that shone in the limpid sky, less lonely, surely, than she upon earth. In vain did her eyes seek in the eyes of another that expression of sympathy and tenderness which alone would console her. The truth is that Maria José was suffering from the disappointment of unrequited passion. She had fallen in love with Montjardin, a poet and great friend of her brother-in-law, Fabio. Montjardin came to the house every Sunday. Older than she, almost forty, but having preserved all the attractiveness of youth, a black moustache, a vigorous yet graceful figure, eyes still bright, charming and wide awake, Montjardin, without knowing it, had conquered Zazé. This had come about in a rather curious manner. Finding the conversation of Fabio's wife and daughters too commonplace, Montjardin, when he would recite some of his poems or tell some story connected with his literary life, preferred to address Maria José whom he saw to be of a serious and impressive nature. "'Let's have another poem, please, Mr. Montjardin,' she would ask in supplicating tone. "'For instance, that one you call Regrets, you know?' And then he would describe in his verse the grief of a heart, disillusioned and broken by the cruelties of fate, that evoked in vain the remembrance of yesterday's lost loves, vanished in the mists of eternal despair." He recited these bitter griefs in a strong, healthy man's voice, erect in the centre of the parlour, looking mechanically, distractedly, at Maria José with his dreamy eyes. The concentrated effort of his memory brought to his face an involuntary immobility which Maria José, most deliciously touched, drank in. The poet had announced that he had written a poem, which he would recite at Zezé's anniversary dinner, the date for this was but a few days distant, and ever since the poet's announcement the whole family had taken to teasing the old maid, christening her the muse of inspiration, and asking her when the wedding would take place. She smiled, ingenuously. At such times her face would even take on an air of unusual happiness. Her features grew animated, less wrinkled, and more firm. On the day of the celebration Maria José came out of her room radiant with hope. At the belt of her white dress bloomed a rose. A little blood, set pulsing by her agitated heart, brought a feeble color to her marble cheeks, from which now protruded her long nose in a manner less displeasing than usual. "'See, mamma," remarked one of the nieces, "'doesn't Zazé look like a young girl today? They dined amidst merry chatter. Seated directly across from Montjardin, Maria José, hiding her glances behind the fruit boughs that covered the table, looked at him furtively without her fate. Her poor heart beat as if it would burst, waiting in agonized suspense for the poem in which the poet, without doubt, was to declare his intimate feelings for her. Montjardin had already pointed to his pocket, as a token that he had the verses with him, and Zazé had trembled with gratification as she bashfully lowered her long face. Champagne sparkled in the glasses, and toasts were given. Several guests of distinction spoke first, then followed the hosts and their children, frolicsome little things. Finally, Montjardin rose and unfolded a manuscript, asking permission to declaim the verses which he had composed in honor of Maria José, the central figure of the occasion. The guests greeted his remarks with noisy and enthusiastic approbation. Here! Here! Ingracina and her daughters leaned over and cast malicious glances in the direction of Maria José, but she was paying no attention to them. 
Her ears were buzzing. It seemed that everything was turning round. Montjardin, the centre of all eyes, made pompous preparation. He pulled down his vest, arranged his leaves, and, in sonorous, cadenced voice, began to recite his alexandrines, scanning the lines impeccably. His poem opened with an eulogy of the ineffable virtue, compounded of self-abnegation and chastity, that distinguished the angelic creature who, with her white tutelary wings, watched over the happiness of his dear friend's love-nest. He then recalled that the date of this day commemorated the happy birth of a being of immaculate purity, Maria José, a veritable saint, who had renounced all her own aspirations, so that she might consecrate herself entirely to the duties of her sister's family. Gentle figure of the mother-guardian, who would soon be the beloved grandmother, sharing with her sister the joys of younger households, which would soon be formed, offsprings of that home which her devoted tenderness as aunt and sister at present cultivated. As he came to a close, the poet raised his cup of sparkling wine, and, in exalted voice, drank to the health of Zezé amidst the loud huzzas of all present. "'Long live Aunt Zezé! Hurrah for Aunt Zezé!' cried the children, glass in hand while the nieces laughed loudly, blushing to the ears, for they had understood very well the poet's reference to future younger households. Fabio and his wife, their eyes somewhat brightened by the strong champagne, proposed in turn their toast to Zezé. Here's to Zezé, and the eighteen happy years we've lived together. Maria José, as soon as she had seized the significance of Montjardin's verses, had grown deathly pale. Stricken by sudden disillusionment, she felt a glacial chill overwhelm her body to the very marrow. She feared that she would faint straightway, and provide a spectacle for the guests, who were all drinking her health, their eyes focused upon her. A veil of tears spread before her sight. In vain she tried to repress them, to force a smile of thanks upon her face. The smile wrinkled into a dolorous grimace. She succeeded only in convulsing her contracted visage with the sobs that she sought to restrain. Overcome at last, humiliated, powerless, she broke into tears, and this unforeseen denouement put an end at once to all the pleasure of the dinner. Zezé, Zezé, what ails you? Engracina had rushed to her side in alarm. Everyone rose, seeking the reason for the outburst. They surrounded the poor creature whose head had sunk upon the table, in the midst of the rose petals, the fruits, and the glasses, which were strewn in charming confusion. "'What is the trouble?' "'A nervous attack, perhaps? Confusion produced in her by the touching poem?' Finally, they raised Maria José's head, and bathed it in cool water, whereupon the face of the poor old maid stood revealed, in all the ugliness that her spasms of convulsive weeping cast over it, with her large, aquiline nose, her protruding eyes, and her livid lips. And now Montjardin drew near. Delicately raising the icy fingers of Maria José, he lifted them to the edge of his perfumed moustache, and placed upon them a grateful kiss. Then, turning to Engracina's daughters, he said, with a solemn, self-complacent tone, Aunt Zezé's tears are the most beautiful homage that could be rendered to my poor verses. End of section 6 End of Brazilian Tales by various authors Translated by Isaac Goldberg